privileged to welcome to the Design Note studio the designer of Vast, the Mysterious Mansion, and the owner of Leader Games and designer of many expansions for Root, Patrick Leader. Patrick, thank you for coming on the show. No problem. So, usually, people are naturally modest. I want you to set your modesty at the door for this first question. All right. So, when did you know you were good at what you do? Oh, boy. Uh, I guess the modest answer that I have to set aside is I still don't think it. But <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, that first Gen Con, after we released Vast, and things were going well, um, and, uh, and and people were coming up to me and praising, like, they, they bought the game at Gen Con. It was really a lot of people's first opportunity to play it. It had just shipped, and a lot of people were coming up to me and, and just, like, gushing about how... Um, it's a complicated game, but people were still... So they weren't, like... They certainly weren't coming up and saying it's very elegant... But, like, the fact that, like, pe people are coming up and saying, here we are, in, and we're playing this game, and we have no idea what the other players are doing, and somehow it still all converges at the same moment, is um, pretty cool to them, that they, mm -hmm. that they were able to hit that moment together out, out of the box. And so I, I think those, were the, those, those are the moments that, that I thought, oh, yeah, this is, this is going to go well. Um, and, and then I... Um, had the opportunity to teach Tom Vassell the game at the beginning of the weekend at Gen Con. And at the top of their show, Saturday morning, uh, David Somerville, the, des the designer, the original designer of Vass, came to the, or Crystal Caverns, came to, um, went to t Tom's show. And they asked Tom at the top of the show, it's been an interesting part about Gen Con for you. And then Tom said, Vass, the I played this game called Vass, the Crystal Caverns, and it's very asymmetric and it's very unique. And David just texted back Bat in the Hatches and um our booth just went nuts after that. Like we and we sold the rest of the games in probably an hour after that. So so I think those were the moments where I was like, Okay, I I've I've made it. I've landed this this uh ship or whatever. I've I've gotten I've gotten to the far shore and things things are going well and people are appreciating the talent I brought to the brought into that situation. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's fascinating because with the it, sort of explosion of games mm -hmm. over the last decades, the, there's been a, an explosion of the commentariat too. How, as a publisher, how sort of much of a contribution do YouTube channels and reviews make to you selling games? Um... I mean, we're. I'm really bad because we don't have good apparatus for recording, for retaining this information yet. And I know other larger publishers probably do retain this information better than we do. But I have a feeling it, it has an impact. Um, I think that, like, if you look at, like, Cole, he definitely has his fan base on YouTube and they will talk up what he's doing and what he's working on quite a bit. And I think that's very important to maintaining our, our relationship with that. Um, you know, with that sort of like maybe ten thousand, twenty thousand large group of people, uh, that's that's how we that's how we maintain contact with them, uh, and that's that's for other people contributing. And we do, you know, we we try whenever we're starting a new project, we try and reach out to a couple of people that are established and a couple of people that are up and coming to try and give them a little bit of a chance to to break break out or whatever, because uh, we know that they're going to get attention from reviewing a new design that we're working on, and. Um, so we do do that. And then, you know, we also, of course, do the designer chat ourselves where every Tuesday we get together and talk, not every Tuesday, every first Tuesday of every month we get together and talk about what we're working on. And I think that's a good baseline for getting uh, people's, I like it because I get people's reactions to things and they get to see what people are interested in. And that can kind of shape the direction of the policy I, I have when I'm, when I'm moving from month to month. So, And so... You know, one one thing about leader games mm -hmm. is it seems to have a singular identity, mm -hmm. right? This is through the kinds of designs that you have, but also Kyle Ferrin's art, 
mm-hmm. it has high production values and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, you, you talk there about getting feedback from people. I mean, to what degree are the games you publish sort of, what's, what's a good word I can think of, a sort of the works of auteurs? And to what degree are they there to sort of service the community's desires? Uh, like as the two, the relationship those two have to each other is it right. Saying? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, it's funny because Cole and I have been uh, litigating my design process a bit lately because I've been kind of getting back into design, right? Because mm. the last four years I've just been working on building sales channels and benefits for people and hiring people and training people, and 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 so there is this concept I think that. Cole pays a lot of attention to the ways that games fit into the lines. And I'm not, this is not judgment. I think this is the right approach. Um, he is focusing a lot on how our line builds together in a way that like, can, will it be accessible to people that are previously working with, that, that have previously played our games and, or will it be accessible to a new audience that we can help bridge into root basically is you know, the thrust of mm. our marketing and um, all, all power to him. I mean, that's, that's going to keep us in business. <laughs> uh, whereas I tend to design um, and, and also in his design, he does a lot more analysis of, I used to do a lot of analysis of numbers also, but that has kind of faded away from me to depend more on my gut. And I, th- I think in that sense, in both the sense that I'm not as worried about the audience and I tend to design from a very naturalistic or like what I'm feeling uh, perspective, mm-hmm. then I tend to focus more on our tour. And I, and I think that is my contribution, even when I'm not directly working on a project, that is my contribution to other projects is that I, is that I come in and I say, this is the creative spark we need, or this is the, the direction that... Um, you know, like maybe here's some direction this game could go in uh, to create, you know, whatever tension. So like, you know, I think putting the Vagabond in Root was weird, right? Because putting mm-hmm. a lone individual in a war game is a strange thing to do. But I really wanted to promote that as a way for people to get into the game easily. Uh, people that haven't played war games before, maybe they've played adventure games and they can get into the, playing the Vagabond that, or get into Root via the Vagabond that way. But also... I just wanted, I thought it was really cool that you could zero it on one person and tell the story that they're experiencing as this war goes on. And so that was, I think that was the R2 approach for me. And I think that would have been, I think in another company, we would have tried it and there have been some challenges to it. There was definitely a challenging thing to get to work correctly. And I think it would have been cut or could have been cut at another mm-hmm. studio, but instead I, you know, I thought it was important. And then, and then Cole, you know, really pushed on getting it to work correctly. So, I mean, no, I'm not stealing any credit from him if he got the game to work, but, <laughs> uh, but I did bring that into the, into that. So, so I would say for, for to answer your question, um, we're, we're about in the middle that sometimes we very, we really focus on what we, we think, you know, the theme needs to be enforced or maybe what, what we're trying to communicate to the world, but also we have this balance of, well, um, this also has to be a playable game at the end of the day. And I think for me, the that's why designing in public on my Twitter or, uh, you know, the original Vast had that that 60-page uh, work-in-progress thread, mm-hmm. which I took over from David, but I maintained it. I didn't just let it wilt. And it, for me, that was important because I got to see how the audience was responding to the design in real time instead of putting everything in a box, getting it made, and hoping that it, it worked out okay. So... And I'd like to get back to more of that. And and so, you know, you have certain directors in theatre and film and people say they're actors, directors, you know, their mm-hmm. focus is on eliciting a great performance from the actor. I mean, you're not only a publisher, you're also a designer. Mm-hmm. So as the sort of head of leader games, do you think your job are you i guess what i'm trying to say is are you a designer's boss are you there to try and elicit the best design from cole from people who are designing yeah yeah. for leader is 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 that your goal essentially yeah absolutely and i um i i think the like best example of where that where you can see that policy in action is there has been 
occasionally there'll be discussion about how we're going to make something and that team you know the team that has to make the products will come to me and say this is going to be challenging or this we need it by this timeline and i've always unfortunately for them <laughs> i've always <laughs> leaned on well creative is going to need more time or creative needs needs this part so we got to figure out how to make that work and it's it's not enough to just uh settle on a smaller the smaller thing and so for instance like i um like for instance i think arcs could have been uh the next kickstarter we're going to do i think we could have been kickstarting it by now um but we've there's been a couple times where we discussed like how are we going to build the, this content and what timeline do we need and how done should it be before we go to the Kickstarter? And I've allowed that discussion to push back the Kickstarter several times. So now we're probably on May is, you know, so we've, we've allowed three, three months to slip. So I, no, I think it's very important for me. And then the, um, I think the other thing I do for the team is I bring, you know, and at this point, Cole and Kyle work very independently anyway, but like my good, my, I feel that my job was to facilitate bringing together a team that could work on all the, the whole design holistically. So when you talk about Kyle being part of the look, like it's not just that he's part of the look, he's there talking about theme pretty early on, mm. which I don't think a lot of illustrators are asked to uh, participate in. I think a lot of illustrators are brought in long after the design is done. And so uh, for me, it's important to allow him space to stretch out and add things to the game uh, that'll fit into the into the game. Um. So yeah, I, I'd say I'm sorry. What was the original question? Um, are you a designer's publisher? It, yes. Are you a designer's boss? Yes, I am a designer's boss, and it is. It has been challenging from a um, uh, kind of managerial perspective that I have to be simultaneously in a role that I'm pushing boundaries a little bit, or trying, you know, trying to figure out how I'm going to design. But also, I have to go back into this team and not be the boss while I'm designing because Cole has to be able to say to me, I don't think this is going to work very well. Um, and so that's, that's been, it's been interesting. <laughs> I mean, how, how difficult is it to do that? Cause fundamentally, you, fundamentally you, you own the company when someone's and, and fundamentally, I guess the buck stops with you. Mm -hmm. How good are you at taking on that kind of criticism? Um, it's, I, I I'm doing okay. I have created a lot of projects in the last year um, because I didn't see the uh, after feedback. I didn't see the the potential for finishing the project being as good. Um, and I I feel like it's funny because I felt bad. Like sometimes I feel guilty about creating projects, like or, or uh, uh, taking projects off the schedule. But then uh, Ted, our accountant, very saliently said, "Yeah, but." some bosses would have just said, no, we're going to make this game regardless of opinion about it mm. uh, because it's my project and I want to get it done. So like, I, you know, that's, that's a really positive spin on, I just didn't want to work on it anymore um, because I didn't, I thought overall it was going to hurt the company. So, um, so I guess that's the, that's the challenge there is, is to avoid the, find the balance between like, this is a pro as an Artur, this is the project I want to do because this is the kind of game I want to play versus how, what's, what is going to appeal to the audience so that I can pay 14 people to continue working here. Um, and uh, I think, I think I've struck a good balance. I haven't soloed a game in a while though. So we'll see when my next <laughs> game comes out. Uh, if, if that, if that experiment's going to pay off or not. <laughs> and and so you, you mentioned that, that you, you have 14 staff, working yeah. for leader games now a lot of people who are i would i would consider sort of similar size companies to you mm -hmm. keep themselves very lean they have a very small sort of staff and mm -hmm. outsource a lot of a lot of work yeah why did you decide not to why did you decide to bring people on and have more of a sort of in-house feeling uh there's a couple reasons um i think the primary not the primary i think one of the most useful for me is that i just i used to temp and contract a lot and i mm. didn't i there was times where i was contracting in positions where i didn't feel comfortable from an ethical standpoint like as a programmer it made sense for me to come in and be like here's a very specific problem i have to fix and i'd come in and i'd fix it and then i'd 
publish the solution in a way that, that you know, their in-house staff could maintain it and then I'd move on. And that makes a lot of sense to me. But there was other times where I was temping where I, I said to myself, I'm clearly just filling in for somebody that they can't find or don't want to hire mm. uh, because they, they're too cheap or, or whatever. So uh, to me, that I d- it just felt like an ethical issue that, that right. to ask somebody to put in a full-time effort or a full-time commitment and then not give them the commitment back just didn't felt disingenuous to me. Um, the other part that I, you know, that I mentioned is that as I have the full creative team here on staff, we can sit down consistently and have a meeting and discuss a project holistically. And so then I, I feel like some of the problems that other companies could run into, I don't know if they do or not, where like, there's clearly a dead end in a design that's still going to get published anyway, or there's some, like you play a game and you go, why wasn't this removed from the design or streamline right. or something like that? Especially in the weight category that we're in where things are a little bit more thematic and there's a lot of options uh, that you move away from the start of the game. You know, I'm not talking about ticket to ride ticket to rides as trim as it can be, but, but other game, you know, like, other games in our weight category, I think sometimes you can play them and go, this all could have been one system and this would have been simpler. And I, I, so I think holistically working as a team on those things, we get to avoid those problems. And that to me is the advantage of having everyone here full time, even if we're not fully utilized all the time. We are moving to a system now where um, each of the developers, if you, you know, if you count me as a developer, um, which I kind of casually engage with because as the boss, sometimes I do have to say, I can no longer work as a developer on this project because I have boss stuff to do. Um, but we now have three development tracks and, and active projects in each of them. And I, and, and now we're able to leverage the advantage of all those develop, all that, all those development hours working together. Um, there's, there's a synergy between all the projects that we can maintain, uh, or even like, you know, ideas that I took off the schedule, we still have, we can still harvest parts of those and move them into other projects. So we, we have that, that, that stable of ideas moving forward. And I think with contractors, you're just not going to get that experience. You're going to lose, someone's going to come in and work on something. They're going to get another job because of economic necessity. They can't wait for you to rehire them. Mm. And so then that knowledge is going to walk out of the building and, and not come back. So, um, and you know, I, again, with contractors, like sometimes it's the right approach to say, I need to get this done. I need to get out. But I, I also feel like a contractor wouldn't have said ARCS isn't ready for Kickstarter and mm. they would have pulled back. They would have just said, I, this is what I'm going to deliver and I'm going to, sure. I'm going to go somewhere else. So, um, so I, I, I think a lot of care for the company, uh, comes, comes from that. I also do a, um, so whenever, I mean, I collect a salary, but I also do a profit sharing model where if I take money out of the company as like, you know, owner liability, so the company's paying, you know, the, the entity of leader games is paying me money for the, uh, for owning the company. And, you know, just, just like stock dividends or however you want to, however you want to think about that. So when that money leaves the company, I actually do split it to, into different pools. And one of those pools is mine, but the other pools are go to the employees. And so I don't get pay, paid unless they're getting a bonus is essentially how, how that works out for them. So, and the, and so that also, I think incentive, that ownership, that sense of ownership of the company incentivizes folks to to work harder um, and to make sure it's not just done, but that everything's working correctly and is a plus work when they're, when they're done doing it. So I take that very seriously and we're working on ratifying it into policy, but Oh my God, does that take a long time? (laughs) There's a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork to do. Um, And then, you know, and the end goal of that then is if for some reason I sold the company, which I have no intention of doing, um, then they would also get paid out along the same lines. So, 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 can you give us? And if we we could take Arc as a as a as a sort of case in point, what is the process from sort of idea to getting a game on the table? Can you give us a sort of overview of that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so Arcs kind of grew out of I was working on another project called Void Lich two summers ago or two springs ago, I suppose. Uh, right at the start of COVID, and it was going to be a space. It was based on an older design of mine. It was going to be like a space for X game, and um, I built it around very six identifiable cultures in the game, not not Earth cultures that I'm appropriating, but but cultures in the game. And I had a lot of lore written for it, and but the game just wasn't quite firing. 
And um, so Cole suggested that he try a space design. He had a few ideas for one. And I, I'm not saying there's a direct line there. Like, mm. like it's just, he's like, well, if we're going to do a space game, let's, can we do it this way? And so uh, Cole took some of my lower notes and started working on a new game. What's resulted from it is broken very far away from, from it. So Arcs is, Arcs is definitely Arcs. There might even be room in the world for Void Lich, either being an Arcs expansion or being its own its own entity still. So uh, so Cole has took it, um, I don't know, he probably worked six, eight, ten months on it solo uh, in his office. Um, he's been, you know, of course he brings in people to play tests and things like that. But he, he's been working on it um, for a while, and now we're nearing the point where um, uh, we're going to start talking about a handoff. So that he's he's designed he's he's been designing it so that it it can be communicated beyond him that like other people mm -hmm. can come in and work on it. So he's writing the rules is really what I'm saying. Um, but during that time, uh, he's pretty free to. I know if you look at Oath and his development cycle on Oath, Oath started out with like a hex map. It had like creatures ruling certain parts of the map. So it was, it, it was a very different different feel uh, when he started. And so during that process, there will be a lot of, um, uh, we call it, I guess, slow iteration is probably the best, best description. So we spend about a week or two on each design. We make changes to it, and then we move on to a, to the next design. And that's I'm going through that process right now with uh, Dungeon Fortress. And then we get to a point where it the system kind of starts to seal or, or gel a little bit, and then I start doing rapid iteration. And so I'll try and play every day, make small changes. If I need to step back and make a large change, I'll take three days to make I'm, and about, in fact, I, after this interview, I'm going to walk right out and do a Dungeon Fortress playtest based on <laughs> based on one of those long changes. Uh, so we do we do uh, you know so we do a cycle of basically, can you play five times in a week? Can you play three times in a week? Can you play one time a week? And there's a different there's a different reason to uh, to engage with either of those with any of those. Uh, we pull people in from the studio to play tests, and I do a lot of um, he and I both do a lot of just sitting and playing solo. By, you know, where you just play a receipt like we did when we were kids. Um, I'm sure Cole did engage with that. I played a lot of games by myself. <laughs> I think that's where some of my design aesthetic comes from. Um, so then, and then at some point, you're going to reach a point where the game is ready enough that, like, like I said, he's going through this process right now of turning the game into writing down the rules, creating a structure. So Arcs is very, um, it has a very large uh, footprint in terms of developing, like the game can develop stories as it goes on. And so that's that's based on a very specific structure he's designing. And so he's writing a style guide for that so other people on the team can come and work on that. And then we'll start doing passes on editing and graphic design and illustration. Um, for us, this design represents a larger effort to insert people into the process earlier, which risks waste. And so we're working on kind of our DevOps and I don't know much about that yet. That's mostly Cole and Josh's initiative. But like Josh wants to get in earlier and edit the rules. He's our editor. And mm -hmm. uh, and that's very fair. I think that's like, you know, saddling him with a large editing project at the end and possibly asking him to change. He might have to come back and say during editing, I have to say this concept isn't going to be easy to explain. Can we actually change the game to make it to make it easier to explain? Which I think has happened. I, I can point in many places where that's happened in Root and Vast, and and so to ask him to do that all at the end is very hard because then you have to re, you have to replay test everything. So now he can come in earlier and say, these you know here's the piece hierarchy. These should be markers. These should be tokens and, and things like that to make the yeah. make writing the rules easier. So I um so we're we're starting to start that stuff earlier and earlier now. Uh, that's about three to four months, and then uh, we start uh, a pre-press process uh, for about a month or two, where we're talking to the uh, publish the, the printer, excuse me, and sending files back and forth, and then they start engineering the production. And you'll get a couple copies early on, and then a couple copies before it goes into like as it's going into production uh, to verify that. It's what you is what you want to. Does this answer your question? I feel like I'm just yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, no, great. absolutely. <laughs> so, so on that, then, I mean, what can we expect from Leader Games in the next twelve months? Yeah. So, um, I, um, I, uh, we're going to be doing a Kickstarter for Arcs very soon, um, and I think we're going to start talking more and more about that. I th the next two designer chats, I think, are going to be more about Arcs. 
Uh, I have been largely off the arcs team, like I was for Oath, uh, just because of how, again, I was, you know, having to deal with the adult stuff of running the company, and mm -hmm. now I'm kind of back to design. And um, and we're probably going to be moving, so now I got to, you know, got to. <laughs> that's another adventure I got to deal with, um, because we're out of room in our current facility. So we're going to be working on ARCs, uh, which will be Kickstarter um, sometime in, in uh, May or some sort of crowdfunding. I have not settled on my my decision about uh, crowdfunding right now. Um, and then we will be doing uh, my project, Dungeon Fortress, sometime early next year. And um, somewhere, somewhere over the course of that year, uh, so I think at Gen Con, we're Gen Con or a little bit after Gen Con, we'll be releasing Ahoy. Have you heard about Ahoy? I haven't. Oh, okay. So Ahoy. So uh, Arcs, of course, is our spacefaring uh, civilization building game um, that, according to Dicebreaker, can be played thousands of times, which I thought was cute because you should be able to play any game thousands of times if you really want to. Um, but it will. Uh, it's going to. the The point of it is that you can play two to four sessions and carry the story through, and then kind of reset the game and and uh, and get back to it. So Ahoy is. Um, coming out this summer and it's going to be our um our uh it's a asymmetric game uh it's a design by greg, uh, greg loring albright and he brought it to us as kind of a space game we have shifted it to be about pirates and sort of a uh fantasy there's humans but there's also like shark people and mollusk mm -hmm. people and things like that so uh, and it's asymmetric so there's this chain of islands that the map describes as chain of islands uh, there is one player is the government who's kind of like trying to shut down and control the islands. There's a revolutionary player, and then there's uh, three player and four player fill in as smugglers that um, uh, as they smuggle goods around the map, the islands have become worth more for the other two players. And so they kind of have a control of the tempo of the game a little bit. So we're kind of that. And then I will be uh, doing Dungeon Fortress, which will get a four letter name soon because <laughs> I can't get away <laughs> from that. And uh, that is about villains uh, fighting for control of a dungeon in the, in, in the world. Um, but the map presents a dungeon that they're fighting over. So, And then I, um, I've been working at night on a project and I just pitched it to the studio and I'm not going to talk about it publicly yet, but uh, it looks like we hit pay dirt. So I'm going to be coming in with that a uh, little bit. It'll be a little bit lighter game uh, pretty soon. So. Fabulous. Well, I've got two more questions for you. So, so you you're at a convention, and you you're in the restaurant, and I'm like, at, oh at, no, COVID. At night. <laughs> I run home, <laughs> <laughs> and you you're coming back from the loo, and you you hear there's a table of gamers, and yeah. you hear leader games mentioned. Yes, and so you sidle into the corner, and you eavesdrop on their conversation. What do you hope they're saying about you? Uh -uh. Oh, I love, and I hear this all the time. My favorite thing is, um, is, and this happened right away, and I kept hearing it happen, is at the convention, I was giving the same pitch all day for Vaster Crystal Caverns, and I got really used to, to, to it. And I love it when I hear somebody talking about the game in the exact words I used. <laughs> and so, so you just, sometimes you'll hear someone giving the same pitch verbatim to one of their friends, and I'm just delighted when I hear that. Um, but I do like, I like the, uh, more so than I feel other game companies, because of the way we approach the design, I think you do see um, a kind of more an academic approach to, to discussing the theme or to critiquing the game. Mm -hmm. And I do like it when I hear those conversations in public. I think those are pretty fun. So, yeah. Hopefully not say anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my last question then is, why yeah. is gaming good? Oh, why is it good? I uh, like it from a from a moral or ethical standpoint. I always like that. I think one of the things about role playing, and I I'm sad when I don't see this connect for a person, or gaming in general. And I you know, to me, a lot of games are role playing exercise, even if they have a winner. Like for me, vast to get the theme right, you have to put yourself in the head of the of the character you're playing, hmm. and to some extent, root and. Um, so for me, I, I like that role-playing gave me an early opportunity in my life to think about other people's experience in life and to empathize with how they're feeling or the decisions that they have had to make in life or whatever. Um, you know, and I think that gave me a broad access to 
you know, like understanding, you know, I'm not going to claim that role playing made me understand being a minority, being a minority in another country made me understand being a minority, but, um, but it still gave me an early access to like, think like the way I think is not how everyone thinks. And I Mm -hmm. need to empathize with how they think and understand where they're coming from. So I think that's, that's the good of gaming. Um, But, you know, I mean, more simply and humbly, it is just a great time. People like it's just fun for friends to get together and still be able to engage each other without having a screen and not, you know, I play plenty of computer games, but I still like the face to face exposure and the the hanging out with my friends. So, I mean, I, I game with people I game with in elementary school. So I, I'm, it's been a long, <laughs> it's been a lot of hanging out. <laughs> so. Excellent. So if people want to know when Arx is yeah. coming onto crowdfunding and all of that stuff, how can they go about doing that? Yeah. So we have, uh, we do use uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and they should follow leader games on any of those platforms. Um, if you want to hear more about the design process, uh, Cole uh, tweets, uh, somewhat predictably, and of course he runs. He also is involved in design with Whirly Gig, uh, his other company, and um, you can follow t- Kyle. Also, uh, just puts up drawings frequently, and then I, uh, of course, talk about design pretty frequently. I used to do an AMA about once every two weeks on there, but I've slowed down lately. So, yeah, and then I'm I'm at Patrick Leader on Twitter. So. Brilliant. Well, yeah. Patrick Leader, thank you very much. No problem. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>